the idea of the conference was uh, Alejandro's idea, so it's not mine. Uh, but I was also interested in both participating in this conference. So um, uh, we will discuss many different points on uh, world making and uh, knowledge and art, I suppose. And uh, the first uh, presenter is Alejandro Ribery. Uh, could you please... Uh, yeah. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you very much. Well, big thanks then to everybody, especially Tanya, who worked so hard uh, for this to happen. Um, we've been corresponding with Tanya for some time now. And, uh, so we discussed the possibility of having this uh, seminar or conference. Um, I'm particularly interested in looking at some fictional constructs and precisely the cognitive effects of that constructs. Um, I'm affiliated at the University of Hull. Um, I did my doctoral thesis on an Argentine writer who uh, is believed to be very philosophical, as Borges is. And at the time I was working on my thesis, I was looking precisely at this kind of uh, fictional constructs. Um, the effects they have on the knowledge of the world that they uh, provide us with. So in my paper, um, I will be referring to basically three um, points. One is Hans Weisinger's contribution to literary and cognitive studies. We'll say two words about Weisinger's um, book, The Philosophy of As If. Then I will refer to um, the nature of fiction and objects, and finally, a brief discussion on Alexis Mining theory of subsisting objects. Those are the three points I will try to cover in this short presentation. Okay? I will be reading most of it, <clears throat> and also I will do some short digressions in between um, sections of my paper. <clears throat> right. Some remarks on the cognitive effects of world making. In this paper, I would like to discuss whether fictional constructs can advance knowledge, or if we were to stick to the title of the seminar, Knowledge Through World Making. There is a field of inquiry that can be broadly defined as the epistemology of fiction. Certain narrative fictions go beyond the make believe they constitute simplicitous discourses whereby reality is represented and encoded. The key concept emerging from this critical stance is that of fiction enacting knowledge. An overview of my presentation is as follows. By Hinger, a uh, very influential book, the philosophy is as opera, few remarks on fictional objects, a short discussion on Alex Minor subsisting objects. Very startful in his provocative study, Hans by Hinger's ghostly presence in contemporary literary studies, has pursued the ambivalent attitude followed by contemporary literary critics towards the figure of by Hinger. In his study, Stanfield cites Wolfgang Easer and then Wayne Thomas, among those who see in the as if the keystone for the theory of fiction. Stanfield argues that although many literary scholars have largely drawn on Weichinger's thought, his presence in contemporary studies has not been openly recognized. The reason for such a denial is to be found, according to Stanfield, in Weichinger's use of a still pre-modern and logocentric vocabulary largely based on the epistemological split subject-object. Yet, 
his reduction of all mental activity to fiction making anticipates post-structuralism and post-modern motif. Peichinger was um, a follower of Kant and he saw in these fictions posited by Kant or extrapolating for those fictions a way of explaining knowledge or the way we obtain knowledge of the world. As we know, Kant had denied epistemological value to metaphysical notions. You remember the long discussion of Kant on the antinomies. There were enough arguments to support one in the idea or the opposite. So the analytic, the synthetic judgment, the empirical and synthetic judgment cannot be passed on metaphysical objects. Yet, Kant says, uh, we must act as if the soul were indivisible, or we act as we were free agents. Okay? And the fiction is justified by the moral actions resulting from that belief. Although we cannot prove that the soul is um, a single unity, or we cannot prove that we are really free, still we have to act as if. Extrapolating from ethical postulates, by Hegel argued that fictions are all pervasive in discursive thought. Only sensations are real. The rest consists in justified fictions, which are only a means aimed at facilitating our ideational capacity. The justification of fictions in discursive thought lies in their expediency. When thought deviates from this aim and becomes itself an end, it throws up problems which are in themselves senseless, such as the meaning of the world or the purpose of life. According to uh, Bichingus, the human mind cannot really take in everything and simplifies it. Simplifies it by means of demoting certain contradictory qualities and just try to focus on those general notes. And hence, he creates these categories of thoughts. This is the way, according to Weichinger, we operate in knowledge. I will allow for you some time to read perhaps the long quote extracted from Weichinger's book, uh, The Philosophy of Asif. Weichinger's works is, is impregnated with uh, Darwinism, if you like. Um, we act in such a way, Weichinger's content, because it's the way that we go about life. It's some sort of survival mechanism. Okay, now we see. Fictions are endowed with our perceiving power by means of raising certain attributes of the real and suppressing others, they make it possible to throw two elements into a comparative apperception. Those finite or imaginary conditions can be factored into positive knowledge. This occurs, for instance, when we subsume one individual into the category reserved to another, as it is often the case in geometry. This example is also extracted from Weichinger's book. If you see that um, symbol diagram and the proposition that reads the circle, the circle is an ellipse, we can understand how contrasting these two figures, okay. um, the idea that every time that the distance between A and B which are the 40 of the ellipse, tends to zero, we have a circle. So I can subsume a circle under the category of the ellipse. This is the method of antithetic error. My Hegel's call this the method of antithetic error. Okay? And it is supported, the proposition the circle is an ellipse, is supported, according to Weichinger, on the fiction 
of the distance zero. The distance zero means no distance. But by pretending, or if I treat AB as if uh, a real distance, then the statement, the circle is an ellipse, becomes uh, much more meaningful. Feisinger generalized this. To him, we always know one thing through another. The mind always acts contrasting elements. I resume my data. The formation of negative, irrational, and imaginary numbers in mathematics follow a similar procedure. There are cases that happen to be most transparent examples of fictions as aid of thought because they show how thought progresses precisely because of this deviation from reality. Besides, the deviations are immediately corrected, whereas in other fictions, amphitheatic errors take place later and therefore are more prone to go unnoticed. What Weichinger says is that the method of amphitheatic error prescribes that I introduce an error as an aid of thought, and then I balance it out by introducing another error. Okay? In this case, the first error is the circle is an ellipse, the second error is the distance zero. He says that examples in geometry and mathematics are very transparent because the correction is operated immediately. Whereas in other fictions, that goes unnoticed because the correction is introduced later. I resume. The heuristic value of such fictions reveals the nature of our process of ideation. The apperceptions that we are able to make are largely based upon these contrastive operations. Notions like the absolute cosmic energy, matter, substance, the infinite, and any such general ideas recognize a similar origin. They are unjustified transferences. From the standpoint of critical positivism, all that remains is sensations out of which the world is constructed with its categories and divisions. These general ideas serve the purpose of understanding the world so that we can move more easily about. The formula as if expresses the reality as given is compared with something whose unreality and impossibility is at the same time admitted. According to Weisinger, the very lexical form as if admits already that I compare reality with something that ideally is postulated but is unknown. Narratives such as Plato Idea Republic, the 18th century French tales of primeval states, and Campanella's and Moore's utopian fictions are mentioned in the philosophy of Asif as examples of cognitive fictions. For Weichinger, in these fictions, a conceptual construct advances an understanding of reality when real values are substituted for ideal representations. The same occurs with issues related to social control. Only because a man is seen as a free agent can be liable to punishment. The premise whether men are really free is not examined by the judge. Likewise, only because it is assumed that every inhabitant of a state has entered into a pact with society is he asked to obey the laws, fiction of the social contract. The power of the state to enforce the law ultimately rests on a fiction. Although contemporary studies have grouped fictions in two large categories, cognitive fictions and narrative fiction, such a difference is far from neat in Weichinger's work. The equivocality is deliberately maintained in Weichinger's book to show the closeness between these two terms. I shall return briefly to Weichinger later, but now, in what follows, I would like to make additional remarks concerning the nature of fictional objects and their entanglement with knowledge and possible worlds. 
fictional objects live in the number of worlds in which they are alluded to. They lack alternative specifications and lack the possibility of our increasing the number of such specifications. But since we are in Moscow, I thought of giving this example. We know that Rodion Romanovich Raskolnikov is very intelligent and devoted to his sister and his mother, but we shall never know the color of his eyes unless we are informed of that physical characteristic of his by the narrator. There is an object directness involved in our reading of fiction that took us into assuming a wholeness which they lack. In fact, fictional objects are strictly confined within the words that go to name them. According to textual theories, the victor at Austerlitz and Napoleon Bonaparte may not be entirely the same, even if we, who inhabit the real world, cannot help making the equivalents. I suppose that well, you are um, familiar with uh, Frege's distinction about um, indexical words extrapolated from this perhaps would be valid to say um, or to explain the nature of fictional objects. Arisian. It is said that fictional entities are intrinsically incomplete. The way of saying is the object of what is said. The incompleteness is caused by their lacking an extra literary object to be confronted with. In the Apadio of text, there is no real object to confront the text with. On the contrary, it is said that scientific or historical texts avail themselves, in principle, of a reference underlying the text their enunciation can be thoroughly determined. The distinction would not satisfy those who take a rather skeptical stance on knowledge and for whom the nature of the universe is very conjectural. The impossibility of reaching the object poses a conundrum from which there is no way out, since all our assertions about reality are bound to be incomplete. Such incompleteness involves all human domains and is not restricted to literature, for reality is always articulated by signs and symbolically mediated. When historical events are presented as general descriptions of objective reality, and even if there are truth claims in history, still there are no unmediated objects as such underlying grand narratives. Moreover, an argument has been put forth to contest that the consistency and knowability exhibited by reality, the object, arises only from the text. In the writing of history, such a consistency is obtained by a tailoring of the facts dictated by the overall form of the story that is being told. What I mean to say is that the historian will encode the so-called historical facts according to a form that is pre-established so that we can have many accounts of the French Revolution. They do not contradict themselves, but they do not aggregate themselves. Okay? We can have as many stories as we choose to tell. History describes past actuality by linking together a series of events in temporal sequence. But those events are dependent on the narrative form in which they are encoded and not the other way around. But there is a further implication to the expression past actuality. In so speaking, we implicitly assume that historical events are units that somehow accord with segments of an untold reality writing to be told. You know that Hegel in his lessons on the philosophy of history 
um, explains that in the German language, Geschichte and history be two terms, which could be loosely translated as history and historiography, coincide. And Hegel attached to these facts a great importance in his theory of the evolving Weltgeist, that evolving produces the world. The concepts of freedom are born with the historical beats themselves at the same time. So there is an absolute coincidence between the narration of history and the historical events. Of course, this has been questioned uh, mainly by well, those um, historians, the so-called uh, narrative in history, like Ricoeur and Danton, Ming and Carr, okay? uh, to whom we do not believe there is a history as such waiting to be told. History is historiography, which is, of course, a very contentious issue, because perhaps there is no history waiting to be told, but the events they leave traces. Um, if all the libraries in the world, the internet and everything were to burn down at one point, the traces are still there. The, the millions of people uh, who were murdered during the war are, are still there, right? So it is still a very contentious issue. But as such, there is no history beyond the writing of history. I reassume, we cannot have a sense of the past unless we experience it. We, uh, uh, sorry, we cannot have a sense of the past unless we experience it through a particular narrative of the past. That is a representation of the past. And although any narrative of the past, although fragmented, is deemed to possess the possibility that it may be expanded to encompass the whole of the past, coinciding point for point with it. Still, the untold past can only be ideally postulated, for there is no unwritten story waiting to be told. It is only through narratives that we can postulate the past. It is always through narratives that the discourse of history can be spoken of. Narratives are diachronic representations based on the fundamental human activity, mimesis. Aristotle's Mimesis Mutus. For Paul Ricoeur, Mimesis opens up the realm of the Asif and fiction in general. The activity of narrating a story and the temporal character of human experience are, according to Ricoeur, interrelated in terms of necessity. Time becomes human when we experience it in a narrative form. Implotment constitutes a sort of mediation between time and narrative. Implotment is defined by Ricoeur as the fundamental connection between the events of a story and their mutual orientation toward the promised end. It is through narratives that we can shape ourselves and have an identity, be it individual or collective. Because of time constraints, I cannot go into depth in Ricoeur's theory, but According to um, Ricoeur, the I, the ego, as a notion, can only be explained through narratives. This is a, a diagram of the London Underground. Tanya, you, you will be very familiar with this, I guess. Um, this is the, the old underground map. Um, is, is the work of Harry Beck and dates back to 1931. The reason why I'm showing it will become clear later. As I read, the two stations and lines, and lines are conveniently depicted with bright colors in clear, understandable manner, but the configuration of the real space has been altered altogether. Maps can only stand for the territory by reproducing its feature on a particular scale so as to constitute an organized whole. A three-dimensional environment is represented as a two-dimensional spatial schemata. 
the size of the map is given by the number of elements included in it. But this number finds a limit in the level of comprehension arising from the map. It cannot be extended indefinitely. If, if I were to fit in all the gaps of that map with real features of the territory, the map would be totally useless. Okay? The map as an instrument for me to orient myself has to neglect a number of features. A hypothetical complete map indistinguishable from the territory will equal near comprehension. It will appear before our minds as a closed entity. We have already seen how explanatory systems always raise certain attributes of the world while suppressing others. That was the long citation from Weichinger. Weichinger says that the mind operates in that way, creates categories by demoting certain characteristics and raising others. But maps, likewise, also neglect certain features of the territory highlight others. So maps use inconsistent scales in order to make visible certain features while others are neglected or ignored altogether. By suppressing elements of the territory, maps advance systems of knowledge. Maps carry knowledge. They are not innocent spatial organization of data, but rather cognitive schemas that chart things under a particular mode of seeing altogether. Um, this is a fantastic map. Um, this is a, a long citation from Horthy's Borges on exactitude of science. This piece has been revisited many times, has been commented upon by Baudry, Yar, and Foucault. And in it, Borges postulates a map of an ideal empire, which is the size of the empire. So it's a map drawn at scale 1-1. One, one. I resume the paper. <clears throat> Horthy's work has postulated a map of an empire drawn to scale one to one. The map of the empire is drawn to the same scale as the empire and coincides with it point for point. The map is superimposed onto the territory, creating the, the utopian paradigm of total representation. Yet, in order to represent, the map must possess a sketchy nature that can be filled in in a continuous and endless progression towards the territory. The ultimate complete territory, like the ideal past of the historian, being unattainable, remains only a postulate of reason. Because the real territory is not given to us directly and comprehensively, the map itself becomes a necessary surrogate territory. Well, that's much for representation. I would like now to refer to Meinung's theory of objects, which stems from a distinction already established by Twardowski in the sense that the object of a presentation of Vorstellung is not imminent in the act and therefore we must separate the content of the art from the object it intends. Minus impossible objects, such as golden mountains and square circles, are particularly valuable for explaining the nature of fictional entities. My development of these ideas aim at showing the entanglement between fiction and possible worlds. Fiction, fiction words are essentially intentional words. The meaning of words determines the things referred to by those words. 
entities that can be found in fictional worlds are intrinsically incomplete. Incompleteness, I would submit, is a central idea to explicate fictive constructs. Incompleteness permit us to posit a possible world. Incompleteness lies at the base of representation. Incompleteness is a condition for the world's intelligibility. As is known, Franz Brentano had already found in intentionality, that is, the ability of a thought to direct itself to something different from itself, the essence of mental phenomena. It is evident that no physical object could exhibit such a property. Thus, all mental states have an object or tend towards an object. From this starting point, Minor will introduce the difference between the content in Halt and the object, Gegenstand, of any mental act. Mind uses object as a general term. Object is what is given in the presentation. Objects can have a real existence, for instance, a tree or a star, or an idea existence, the number seven, the relationship of identity. The latter objects are deemed to subsist, the stehen in Mind's terminology. Existence and subsistence are two distinctive and self-evident modes of being. I quote, being can be existence, but also subsistence. The sun exists, equality, and similarly, any other ideal entity cannot exist but can subsist. To this, Mayan will introduce later a new category of objects, the Außer sign is some sort of neologism in, in German, meaning something like what lies outside the sign, the being. The reasoning that leads to it, to posit this Außer sign category, can be summarized as follows. When I think of a round square, I have an idea to which no real or ideal object corresponds for the content of the idea entails a contradictory property. The sole being of the round square implies its non-existence. But even this does not enter in the nature of the round square, and our prejudice in favor of the actual should not make us treat it as merely nothing. As you know, my had a, um, a very virulent <laughs> Uh, argument and, and debate with Bertrand Russell. To Bertrand Russell, he was just abusing language, but if he sticks to this take on fictional objects and ideal objects, and if he separates um, the content of my act of commission from the object that he intends, that would be the natural consequence of it. As we can see, Mayan holds the view that whether an object is or is not, and even if we deem the object to be empirically impossible, this makes no difference to what the object is. And only if we assume that such intentional objects have a number of properties can there be knowledge about them. Such a field of inquiry is often ignored due to our practical interest, but we do not have to forget that entities such as numbers, values, simultaneity, limit, gap, and even the notorious nothing, nichts, which are actually non-existent, go towards the construction of the real world. <laughs> That's funny. The, that is the, the, the double S in German, right? Yeah, the, the, the beta. <laughs> Very creative. Yeah. No, Good. No journal language in my Right. Okay. Okay, that, that should be Auser sign. Double dance. Okay, they will be better. Auser sign. Okay. Now, Mainan uh, remind us that categories like limit, gap, or the notorious nothing, which are equally non existent, they subsist go towards the construction of the real world. Drawing conclusion between the content of a mental act, on the one hand, 
and the intention or object of the act on the other, minor passes beyond the confines of the actual universe. The fact that other possible worlds often do not play any part in the real world is not a good reason for transferring them exclusively to the mind and reducing them to simple mental activity without any ontological status. But what can uh, what kind of reality these possible worlds have? What what is the reality of these objects? To what extent can it be said that things can be otherwise or might have been otherwise? The actual I'm referring to what ontological status should we attach to this possible world. The actual is said to be fully determined and bound to the history of the universe and as such unmodifiable. Indeed, seen any possibility entails a state incomp incompatible with factuality, it has to be said that possibility is only a degree of our knowledge or ignorance. But, as we can see, mind does not think that's the case. Since the object of any given idea has an independent existence from the idea that presents it, any possibility as such also constitutes an object. And objects that exist, subsist, or lay outside sign are all. Furthermore, any possibility entails an object embedded in the object that exists. These general objects which retain various possibilities are all embedded in the concrete existence. They are incomplete objects. The square as such, the color red, the manhood of the man. Minon felt it necessary to posit the incomplete objects in order to explain how the concrete objects of our experience are presented to us. When I see a person walking by, I'm aware of him as a man. That is the way in which I grasp the very complex nature that lies behind his presence. The incomplete objects of our reference constitute a sort of matrix to which the multiple objects of our experience are related. He further argued that the incomplete objects make possible all knowledge of concrete objects. They are a sort of aid for the apprehension of the concrete existence. The incomplete objects are not bereft of the particulars because they have been mentally stripped of them, but rather they are intrinsically incomplete. That is the only way that they can access our thought. Otherwise, we will find ourselves looking at another map drawn on scale one to one. The vagueness of our knowledge of concrete existence lies in the fact that we do not have direct access to things except by means of the incomplete objects embedded in them. As Mayan points out, we know, we know things by description and not by acquaintance. But this incompleteness of the objects of our experience is what brings about all possible worlds. For the incomplete objects are embedded in the real objects, giving to them a sort of derivative reality. And it is precisely this derivative reality that provides the material for all possible worlds. The chief value of Magnus' theory of possibility is that it enables us to say in a precise manner what we mean when we say vaguely that things might have been otherwise. In one respect, those who state that only the actual is possible are right it is quite senseless to say that this world might have been different, that Beethoven might have had some other father than his actual father, that Moscow might have been built some miles further up the coast of the river. But it is only because we have dragged in the real world these consequences whole. When I speak of a world, a man, or a town, I can pass beyond the confines of the actual universe. This world could not be other than it is. But there might have been another world resembling this in some points and differing in others. 
Thus, possibilia is opened up by the means of the incomplete objects. Objects that exhibit the degree of incompleteness are connected to possibilities. They can pass from one universe to another and thus allow us to explore those derivative realities, the kind of derivative, derivative realities that possible words always introduce. The analysis of possible words within the framework of Minus theory of objects proves to be a rich heuristic approach for discussing the epistemological value of fictional discourses. Possible words are endowed with epistemic power. We can explain an object by saying that it's like or differ from another thing whose existence is imaginatively posited and contrasted. We can manufacture whole sets of possible words by conjoining simple components in a creative process that allow us to explore complete new scenarios of thought. Fictional words are a discrete case of possible words. They have a bearing on knowledge inasmuch as they provide forms to this creative process. Like mining subsistent objects, they are mined independently and can be called forth and dissolved in a matter of seconds, but they secretly subsist all the time. If in the 18th century a utopian tale had described computers as a device to be invented in the future, this statement could not have become a fact when computers did get invented two centuries later. It was a fact even then, although the minds of that time were unable to apprehend it. To conclude with my remarks, it is our limited capacity to attend the world which renders all maps incomplete. Yet it is the incompleteness of maps and representations which prompts our seeing all the vagaries under a unifying form. We cannot enter the world without representations of some sort, without our language games, nor can we attend to what is ubiquitous. And ubiquitous is the world. It cannot be shown by contrast with competing features unless we bring these possibilities forth. As we have seen, these possibilities are inscribed in the objects so as to give them a derivative reality that can be explored, provided that we transpose the boundaries of our factual world. Fiction, then, is the form we give to these possibilities, a form which is also the content. We can know the world contrasting it with or liking it to the possible. Or, as by Hinger has it, all cognition is the perception one thing to another. The discourse of fiction is the locus or the realm of the possible and the imaginable, which is always barred by our custom, by our habits of thought, can be experienced under the form. In this scheme of things, fiction has cognitive effects, effects of truth. Thank you.